Okay, I'm starting the recording. Just waiting to see, do we have everyone in now, Jenny? Uh, so, yes, I admitted everybody. They're just still connecting, some of them. We'll give it just a few seconds then. Make sure everyone gets in. Hello guys, happy Friday. It is Misty um, and we also have Jenny on here and um, we are bringing you this week's educational webinar is going to be on telemedicine and Gervais syndrome, connecting with your specialist across the distance. Um, we have two special guests with us today. So we have Katherine Helbig, she's a genetic counselor program manager and Dr. Mark Fitz Gerald, he's the pediatric neurologist, and they both are from Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, better known as CHOP. So um, we're looking forward to having you guys and hearing what you have to say. Thanks for joining us. Great. Thank you. Thank you for having us. All right, Mark, are you gonna share your screen? Uh, sure. It is, can you guys enable me to screen share? Looks like it's disabled right now. All right, there we go, good. All right, so thank you all for the invitation to speak today. So as Missy said, my name is Katie Helbig. I'm a genetic counselor in the Division of Neurology at CHOP. Um, so I'm the director, one of the directors of our Epilepsy Neurogenetics Initiative. And our program is a specialty epilepsy genetics program and it's also designated as a Dravet Comprehensive Care Center. So we wanted to talk to you a little bit about how we've adapted to telemedicine and how that might be applicable to your kids. And I'm joined by my colleague, Dr. Mark Fitzgerald, who's an attending physician and child neurologist at CHOP, and he's also a member of our epilepsy neurogenetics team. And Dr. Fitzgerald has also been really instrumental in spearheading our transition to telemedicine. So we thought that we could tell you a little bit about how we've adapted and answer some of the questions that you guys might have about how this could be applicable for your own kids. So. I'm going to pass over to Mark, who's going to tell you a little bit about how an evaluation by telemedicine works for child neurology. Thank you, Katie. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think maybe the most important message that we can provide for you guys today is that um, telemedicine exists and it is in use now. Um, uh, it was sort of uh, pushed along a lot by the COVID pandemic out of really necessity, but the concept of telemedicine has been there um, uh, for, for years. Um, and we want you to be aware of the option um, to utilize it during this time and potentially in the future as well um, to be able to reach out and um, you know, a, a achieve specialty care where maybe it would be problematic or uh, hard to do um, under normal circumstances. So what is telemedicine? Um, at its core, it's really, um, obtaining medical consultation using um, audiovisual devices rather than um, uh, being in the office in person. And it really wasn't something, uh, like I said, that was widely available prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. But I think in the last several months, um, we all recognized that medical care couldn't stop. There was still gonna be medical need um, and uh, particularly outpatient need for children with epilepsy and, and children with Dravet syndrome specifically. So, um, what we really did was was sort of adapt um, almost overnight our entire sort of care delivery plan um, to be um, over uh, video links um, rather than in person. And I think it's important to recognize now, at least um, for the time being, uh, insurance plans have provided emergency authorizations to be able to cover such services. So I know that's um, often a, a question, you know, would insurance pay for this? Would it be covered? Um, and the answer at the moment is yes. Um, so how does it actually work? Uh, a little bit of the nuts and bolts about it. So um, in order to connect to a telemedicine visit, um, typically patients will download some sort of application that their provider uses and, and log on um, to start the video visit. Um, and the concept operates very similar to a, sort of a FaceTime or video call that you're I'm sure all familiar with um, from your smartphone use, but um, the specific applications are all um, 
are all unique to the institution and they have specific privacy and security features to ensure that they're all compliant with HIPAA laws. Um, and what you, um, what you get with these applications are live video and audio um, and of both the provider and on the patient side. So um, we can see you, you can see us, we can converse just like we were in the office together. Um, and that can be over uh, cellular or Wi-Fi connections and a number of different devices are, are uh, possible to use. Um, some applications work better on computer, others work better with uh, devices like an iPad or a cell phone, but all are really possible. Um, and the duration of the visits are pretty similar to what we are, are able to provide in the office. Sometimes they're a bit longer than a typical in-person consultation because you have to um, sort of account for technical difficulties, which um, do arise intermittently, um, you know, really through no fault of, of our own, other than, you know, sometimes Wi-Fi traffic is, is pretty dense. So, um, I think a very important thing to recognize is that we can provide a lot of the same care, if not almost all of the same care, over a telemedicine link compared with um, the care you might or uh, might receive in the office and the sort of care that, that you're all used to on a day-to-day -day basis with your children. Um, so what sorts of things can we do? I mean, we can easily have a discussion about um, seizures, developmental progress, um, how medications are working, if you're encountering any side effects. Um, and for follow-up visits, we can talk about any, any particular concerns that might have come up either on a the medical side of things or the neurological side of things with, um, with your child's care. And there are certain elements of the physical and neurological examination that we can do reasonably well um, through a telemedicine link. In some instances, and, and largely that's based upon the, um, the elements of the exam that we can observe well, um, there's certainly things that you might um, be used to having performed in the office that we can't do over telemedicine. So, um, on the examination front, obviously I can't listen to um, a child's heart or lungs over a video link. Um, and other more specialized parts of the neurological examination like assessment of muscle tone and assessment of reflexes, those really require hands-on assessment and, and those don't translate well over tel telemedicine. Other things we, we can't do accurately over telemedicine are um, get current vital signs, um, current weights. Um, admittedly, in the last couple of months, I've been doing um, a lot of, of care based on family reported weights. I think most of us have, have scales in our home and they actually are reasonably accurate relevant, uh, relative to the in-hospital scales. So there's certainly some things like that we can compensate for as best as possible. Um, I think one of the, the biggest um, drawbacks to telemedicine is that we, we aren't able to do EEG remotely over a video link like that. Um, I think it, EEG certainly has um, uh, roles in the care of patients with Dravet syndrome, but I think in many ways I would, I would argue that um, uh, a lot of what we know and a lot of what we utilize um, on a day-to-day -day basis to manage um, the seizures uh, in children with Dravet syndrome are somewhat independent of EEG results. So, you don't always need um, access to EEG to be able to provide that sort of sort of care. So how long is a telemedicine visit? It, like I said, it's really it typically uh, the same as what you have um, in an in-office visit. Um, we're able to provide both initial consultations or follow-up visits via telemedicine. And, um, at CHOP and within our program, we've done um, many of both types of visits uh, over the last few months. Um, and I think another question that comes up a lot is, um, do I have to keep my child in front of the, the video screen for the entire appointment? And truly the answer to that is, is no. Um, the parts of the appointment that would uh, benefit from visual assessment and, and some elements of neurological exam, your child has to be present for. But would say a lot of uh, a lot of the care discussions are things that we can do very well um, while you know your child's off with um, you know either another parent or another care provider um, so we can get that one-on-one -on -one time um, without them there. Um, another common question that comes up who who can actually provide a telemedicine visit um, and 
at this point, I, th I think most providers that your child might see in person can do telemedicine visits. Um, and really the only dependencies or things that, that we um, need to have in place to make sure that that will be possible would be um, a HIPAA compliant compatible um, telemedicine application, um, the proper state licensures to practice. You know, I think um, in many cases, uh, and actually in all cases, the uh, licensure is based upon the state in which you reside, not the state in which I happen to be. So um, if you're a resident of, say, New Jersey, and we're physically in Pennsylvania, your provider needs to be licensed in the state of New Jersey to be able to provide telemedicine services. And you can sort of translate that across the country to all of your, um, your own uh, individual states. Um, and then, of course, you know, as long as there's insurance approvals to be able to um, to provide that sort of service, which at the moment, given the COVID pandemic, there are, um, then that's really all you need um, to be able to fly with a telemedicine visit as a provider. Um, we all hope, and I think that uh, we've noticed in the last two months that the um, the benefits to telemedicine have been pretty clear in our patient population. Um, and in general, families have very much um, liked the experience um, with very few exceptions. So, um, you know, it, it remains a little bit to, to be seen what role telemedicine will play after the pandemic is over. Um, and uh, we're, I think, are all hoping that, um, that it will be around to stay in some capacity for, for um, uh, certain types of care. So how can you schedule a telemedicine visit? Really all you need to do is call your provider um, and find out if they're participating and if they have um, the proper uh, HIPAA compliant applications to be able to for perform the visit. I would say that most major medical centers these days um, are all providing this type of service now. Um, if you're primarily seeing a neurologist in a uh, private practice, then there may be um, some differences there. Um, in terms of uh, whether or not that private practice has access to the similar and appropriate technologies. Um, and at this point, and, and it has been like this since the beginning of March, um, I chop all of our neurological consultation, both with epilepsy for children with Dravet syndrome, but also for other neurological conditions, um, is being done via telemedicine. Um, and I think it, it commonly comes up a question about whether or not there'll be a long wait um, or if there's a delay to accessing care in, in telemedicine. And um, I can comment that our, our wait times at this point are, are really no different than what would have existed pre-COVID um, uh, to get in-office consultation. So there's really not a delay. Um, and in some cases, some families have been able to access care recently, perhaps faster than they would have been um, uh, in scheduling a more traditional office visit. So, what are commonly seen as advantages of, um, for telemedicine? I think some of these are going to be um, pretty obvious to, to many of you. Um, you can see your doctor with whom you're familiar and who knows your child from the comfort of your own home. You don't have to travel. You don't have to worry about parking. You don't have to worry about who's going to take care of the other kids while you're, while you're away, um, especially for those families who are traveling distances to see specialists, um, as many of our, our patients do at CHOP. Um, there's very similar quality of care to in-office visits for, I would argue, almost all elements of epilepsy care. Um, so not only is it more convenient, it really is equivalent for most, uh, most aspects of care that, that we need. Um, and we've also noticed that it's that it has increased um, access to care for for some families. So perhaps those that maybe would not have been able to um, uh, participate in subspecialty consultation with epilepsy providers who are very experienced in managing children with Dravet syndrome, um, you know, because of distance or uh, because of ease of access, perhaps that wasn't possible in the past with in-office visits and. Um, it's certainly much easier to connect with those type of providers now um, with telemedicine in place. So what are some of the disadvantages? Well, as I said already, EEG is not available. Um, in some instances where we've felt in the last two months that EEG would be very um, helpful or important um, 
at, at that particular point in time, we've been able to arrange an in-person EEG followed by a telemedicine visit with one of our providers, including myself. So um, there are ways to sort of uh, pair those things up if, if your provider feels like EEG would be really, really important at this point in time um, to help guide certain aspects of, of your child's care. Um, like I said before, there are some physical exam things that we really can't get a good assessment of um, over video link, including muscle tone and certainly um, abnormalities in muscle tone, whether that be um, increases or decreases in tone, um, certainly have an impact on both physical mobility um, for many children with Dravet syndrome and other neurological conditions. Um, and there's also certain, you know, targeted uh, interventions we might do for those children um, if we're able to um, get a good assessment of the muscle tone. Um, so in that, in, in that essence, it, I don't think telemedicine will fully replace in-office consultation for a lot of these elements, but um, I think as a supplement, it certainly is, um, it certainly has a role. Um, and admittedly, there are, there are some aspects of care that just go better with um, uh, in-person uh, interaction. And uh, in some instances, we've noted that um, new disclosures of new genetic testing results can sometimes be hard to do over a video link. Um, and just from an interpersonal dimension um, can go much better uh, in person. I think if you, um, in many ways, think back to that, that first day that you got um, the diagnosis of Dravet syndrome uh, in your children, uh, that's certainly an emotionally laden experience. And I'd say in many ways, um, that emotion translates better in person. Uh, compared with over video. <clears throat> so what type of epilepsy care do we think goes what, pretty well over a telemedicine link? Um, I think uh, in a number of instances so far, we've, we've noticed that um, second opinion consultations with experts in Dravet syndrome um, have been possible, um, especially with follow-up care that will remain with your local neurologist. That was something that was um, a fair bit harder to coordinate. Um, uh, with in-person consultation, but um, does go quite well um, over telemedicine links. Um, we all, we've also noticed that uh, initial visits with a specialist followed by planned in-person follow-up visits in the future um, also go quite well. Um, and in that instance, um, you can get that sort of uh, initial consultation with, with that expert um, over a video link um, with the understanding that you'll be meeting them in the office uh, at some point thereafter. So we've certainly coordinated um, a fair number of those um, types of visits so far. Um, and probably, in my opinion, the, the aspect of epilepsy care that goes the best over telemedicine are those follow-up visits where you really um, want to hone in on discussions about medication effectiveness, side effects, what other treatment options are out there for for children with Dravet syndrome. Um, uh, those types of visits, I think, depend far less on the things that we can't do well over telemedicine, like EEG and physical examination. Um, and those really lend themselves um, really nicely to telemedicine visits, because um, they play to the strength of, of what we can do via telemedicine. So Katie, I think you wanted to sort of take over here a little bit. Yep, I just need to unmute myself. Um, so I wanted to talk about our epilepsy genetics program um, and specifically the components of our multidisciplinary program that we've adapted to telemedicine and how this might apply for uh, families of kids with Dravet syndrome who might be seeking out expert guidance that might not have been available before, but now we can offer by telemedicine. So our epilepsy genetics program at CHOP is the Epilepsy Neurogenetics Initiative, or we call it ENGINE. And the goal of the program is really to make genetics available to all kids with epilepsy and to provide comprehensive multidisciplinary care to kids who have genetic diagnoses, such as Dravet syndrome. So I'm one of the directors of the program, along with Dr. Goldberg, who's a member of the SAB, the Scientific Advisory Board for the Dravet Syndrome Foundation. And um, Dravet syndrome is one of the most common conditions that we both diagnose and see in kids who come through our program. So I think it is the most common thing that we see. Um, so we have significant expertise in managing children with Dravet syndrome, often through a shared care model. So often we see patients for second opinions, and then we work with the primary team 
um, locally to provide a care plan for these kids. So Mark, you wanna to go to the next slide? So the main goals of our program are first of all, like I said, to make sure that a genetic evaluation is available to all children with epilepsy. So if there's a genetic diagnosis to be made, we wanna make sure that we're making those diagnoses. The second goal is to make an individualized treatment plan available to these kids based on the genetic diagnosis. So most of the kids with Dravet syndrome obviously will already have had a genetic evaluation. Go back, Mark. <laughs> but the, I think where Dravet, this applies to Dravet syndrome is um, in goal number two. So we want to take that information and make a care plan that's individualized. And on the research side, the third goal is to use that genetic information to make um, breakthroughs in terms of treatments. So I think you're all aware that there's a lot of really exciting research being done in the field of Dravet and SCN1A related epilepsies um, in terms of new treatments. And that's something that we're working towards as well. And um, we're doing a lot of research in SCN1A in our program. So these are kind of the three goals and we wanna make this available to everyone who comes through the program. All right, now you can go to the next slide. So you can click through, there's lots of animations here, but you can click through to all of them. Keep going. All right, there you go. Um, so this is just how a, a patient or family might experience the clinical side of the program. And we really do take a comprehensive and multidisciplinary approach to care. So we have um, a patient services team that really guides families through the intake and scheduling. And then families can choose from the different components of care that they might need based on their individual child. And in our uh, multidisciplinary clinic, we have a team of attending neurologists. So Dr. Fitzgerald's one of them, team of genetic counselors and physical and occupational therapists. And we see, we traditionally have seen families um, together in person, but obviously we've adapted that to an um, online or a video format, which I wanna talk about briefly in a moment. And then we take all of the information together about the genetic evaluation. So if a child doesn't have a genetic diagnosis, we'll undertake a genetic evaluation, but for someone like um, a patient with Dravet syndrome, we'll take the genetic information into account to put together a care plan. And like I said, that may involve working with the local team, um, to make sure that there's kind of a managed shared care model. We also offer enrollment of research studies to everyone we see to make sure that everyone has um, access to things like clinical trials that might be coming through the pipeline. And then we can coordinate with other medical specialties that might be relevant as well, such as ketogenic diet or GI or neuro-ophthalmology um, to make sure that there's really a, access to comprehensive care um, for things like Dravet syndrome. So now you can go to the next slide. So many components of this model have been adapted to, to telehealth. And I wanna talk about how some of these things look specifically for care of kids with Dravet syndrome and how um, we've been doing this remotely by our video visits. So I wanted to talk first of all about genetic counseling since obviously I'm a genetic counselor and that's something that's important to me, but also because the genetic counselor and the neurologist are kind of the core component of our program. So everyone, who is seen in our clinic is seen by a neurologist who specializes in epilepsy genetics as well as a genetic counselor. And certainly every child with Dravet syndrome, especially if they're a new patient, meets with a genetic counselor as well as a neurologist. And um, I mention this because it's recommended that all kids with Dravet syndrome are offered genetic counseling. So this is a recommendation from the International League Against Epilepsy. But I also say this recognizing that this may not be something that everybody has access to. So some of you may have had um, genetic counseling when you got your diagnosis, but there are fewer than 100 genetic counselors who actually specialize in epilepsy. So I think it's unfortunately not common that families of kids with Dravet syndrome have access to an expert who actually knows um, about Dravet syndrome. So we've um, been able to adapt our genetic counseling to telehealth. Um, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But for those of you who haven't had the experience of genetic counseling and are wondering, you know, what does that even mean? I kind of conceptualize it as like science communication. I think of us as science communicators. So we can help you understand what the diagnosis means for your child, but also for other family members. If there's questions about understanding, you know, the biological basis of it, do you want to understand more about what the sodium channel is doing? And you want to understand more about the disease mechanism, we can help you understand that. There may be questions about risks for other family members. If you're interested in planning a family and you want to know what the chances are that you might have another child with this condition, we can help you understand that, coordinate testing. So I know that there's um, some chance that parents may be what we call silent carriers or maybe mosaic. So we can help coordinate genetic testing if that's a consideration. So um, this is all involved in the process of genetic counseling. And there have been studies that have shown that 
telehealth genetic counseling is just as effective as um, in-person genetic counseling. And this has certainly been our experience in the program as well. And we can do things like coordinate genetic testing remotely um, in our televisits too, because labs are now sending genetic testing kits out to people by UPS and FedEx. So if there is some question about testing other family members or parents, that's something that we've been able to coordinate. So this is a really important component of our clinic um, and something that we offer to all families of kids with Dravet syndrome. And that may not be something that everybody has access to. So I think that's a huge bonus in adapting to telehealth is that this is something we've been able to open up to people who may not have had access to it before. All right, next slide. So another component of our multidisciplinary clinic is occupational and physical therapy. And I, you may be asking yourself, how could this be adapted to telemedicine? And I was asking myself that same thing when we were kind of thinking about how to transition our program to telemedicine, because it doesn't seem on the face of it that this would be something that you could easily do by telehealth. But it turns out that you actually can, and there are many aspects of an OT and PT evaluation that do translate quite well to telemedicine. Um, and this might involve an ev evaluation, assessment, there's a lot of educational components that go well over telemedicine, and sometimes even therapeutic interventions. But I think um, an important point is that the parent and caregiver role in an OTPT telehealth evaluation is really critical. So it will involve a lot of parents and caregivers coaching or guiding their children through the interventions or evaluations that the um, therapist on the other end of the video link is guiding you through. So it is very interactive and in this part of the evaluation your child really would need to participate and be involved. But um, in our experience it has worked quite well and in some ways there are actually some benefits of a telehealth evaluation by OT and PT because it allows the therapist to see your home environment. So they can see, for example, the equipment that you might have for your child, which they wouldn't be able to do in an office environment. So rather than explaining the piece of equipment you have, they can actually physically see it. They can also see your home and the things that your child may need to navigate, which they couldn't do from an office visit. So in some ways, there are actually some benefits to a telehealth evaluation by OT and PT. But obviously there are some drawbacks as well, which Dr. Fitzgerald had touched upon um, from the neurological perspective, things like strength and tone can't be assessed. The therapist can't physically um, be involved in the evaluation of the child, so they can't guide the child through the exercises. They can't um, you know, be involved physically in that way. But we found that this works quite well. And for our kids that we see in our program who do need OT and PT services, this has been a really great supplement during this time. So if your child qualifies for these services um, and isn't receiving them at this time, I, I definitely encourage you to reach out and see if this is something that could be available to you because um, I think that there would be a great benefit to it if it's available. All right, next slide. Um, and there are definitely other aspects of comprehensive Dravet care that we offer in our program and that are likely available in other centers as well that have translated well to telehealth. So the ketogenic diet is very important for many kids um, with Dravet syndrome. And maintenance of the diet is certainly something that we're continuing to do by, by telemedicine. So one exception to that is if you're starting the diet, that obviously will require, at least in our center, an inpatient admission. Um, but once you're on the diet and you're maintaining it, that's something that you can continue to do by telehealth. And many of our kids with Dravet who are on the diet continue to meet with the keto team regularly by telehealth, and that's going quite well. And there are many other specialists across our institution who continue to provide telehealth consultations um, for, our, for kids with Dravet syndrome. So we can continue to provide the comprehensive care for our kids that we would have done normally just by telemedicine. So this has really worked quite well. All right, next slide. So um, we've gotten a lot of questions and there's some considerations to think about when you're wondering what aspects of care can translate to telemedicine. And if you have any other questions, please put them in the chat box and we're happy to answer them for you. So obviously one of the biggest questions is whether or not insurance will cover a telemedicine visit and specifically Medicaid. So Mark, you can click again. Um, so as Dr. Fitzgerald mentioned, most insurances are covering telehealth visits, um, specifically during the COVID-19 pandemic. This does include Medicaid. So obviously you would wanna check with your own specific health insurance um, to see if this is the case. 
but most of them have put in at least temporary considerations to cover these visits. It does remain to be seen how this will continue post COVID, but we're hopeful that this will continue at least in some form because we've certainly seen in our own practice that there is a role for telemedicine in child neurology broadly and certainly for the care of kids with Dravet syndrome. So am I able to see a new provider or obtain a second opinion? So I think this is really relevant for Dravet syndrome where you may want to have access to a specialist provider where you may not have that before. Um, so yes, you can. So we want to click again, Mark. So most states don't require that you have to have an in-person um, relationship established. So that obviously varies from state to state. And when you're scheduling, you would want to make sure that you ask that question. But in most cases, you are able to see a new provider or obtain a second opinion. Um, and this works really well for things like Dravet syndrome. So oftentimes when we see kids with Dravet, we will work with their local team to um, provide a shared care plan of management. And something like telemedicine would be ideal for that. So you may need to just check in with a Dravet specialist once a year um, and then see your local neurologist more, more frequently. So something like this might work quite well with that. All right, click again. So can you see a specialist in another state? This is a tricky question. So you wanna click again, Mark? It really varies by state and by institution. So there are some considerations about medical licensure. There have been some waivers and some relaxation of these guidelines put in place due to COVID. But as Dr. Fitzgerald said, generally the medical provider you see has to be licensed in the state where you're physically located. Although this does vary by state and by institution. So certainly check if you're interested in seeing a provider at an institution out of state, certainly ask. So we have some um, flexibility to see patients out of state at CHOP, for example, um, due to the current public health emergency. Some tricky situation is the out-of-state Medicaid. So that's certainly possible, um, but it does require prior authorization, which also varies by state. So some of these are um, on a case-by-case -case basis, but I would certainly ask if you're interested in seeing an out-of-state provider, um, what the considerations might be. So Dr. Fitzgerald sort of covered this one if your child needs to be present during the entire evaluation. So for an initial visit, if you're meeting a brand new provider, your child should certainly be present for at least part of the evaluation because you would want the provider to get to know your child and part, they should be able to examine your child for part of the visit, but certainly they don't need to be present during the whole thing. If it's a follow-up visit where the provider already knows your child, oftentimes they don't need to be present during any of that. It really depends what the purpose of the discussion is. And we certainly um, understand that sitting in front of a computer screen or a tablet or an iPhone is not necessarily the most interesting thing for a kid. So they don't need to be there during the whole time. So those are some of the common questions we get. Um, Mark, do you want to wrap up or would you like me to wrap up? No, that's all right. I can, um, I can sort of jump back in. So I, sure. I think we wanted to offer just a few concluding points just to sort of summarize um, sort of the, the big picture items here. And, and I think it's important for everyone to recognize that um, telemedicine really does offer both uh, convenience um, as well as safe and effective epilepsy care for patients with Dravet syndrome. And um, re really, I think the most important message is most of what we do at a typical in-office visit um, we can also do just as well via telemedicine. Um, and I think as, as Katie has said um, as well, that can really provide a lot of um, uh, improvements to access to, uh, that families have uh, to comprehensive care centers like CHOP and um, other institutions in the country where perhaps you would not have had uh, the same access uh, more traditionally. It's true that some things will still require in-person care. Um, so I think maybe an ideal model for the future would be one that incorporates both periodic and office visits for those items that um, are, are really necessary in person, um, as well as a mixture of telemedicine visits for, um, for certain aspects of care. Um, and we really do believe that telemedicine is going to continue to play some role in epilepsy care even after the COVID pandemic is over. Our institution, as well as others, have really been um, publishing a fair bit recently about our experiences and how we've adapted and what we've found um, in terms of the, the quality and, and convenience of the care that we can provide. And I think that's going to go a long way um, towards really getting telemedicine established more firmly in epilepsy care moving forward.
All right. So this is our team. Um, I just wanted to thank all of our team. So this is our clinical team at CHOP with our neurologists, genetic counselors, and PTs and OTs. Normally we work together in person. We haven't physically seen each other for two months, so we miss each other a lot, but we're continuing to work well together over um, video, video visits. So we're happy to take any questions that you guys might have. Thank you all so much again for the invitation um, and for all of your attention. So please let us know if there's any questions that you have. Right. Does, if anyone would rather just ask the questions, just unmute yourself. Otherwise, you can put them in chat if you have any. If not, that means you guys did a great presentation and now everyone knows what they need to do. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like we're good. Um, you don't have anything, Jenny, right? You don't see anything? I don't see yeah. anything, no. All right, we're good then. Thank you both for joining us today. Um, a lot of good information there. I think I'll definitely call my neuro and see if we can do a telemedicine visit, make my life a little easier. Um, yeah. I really appreciate it. Um, since everyone's on, I just want to remind you next Thursday, May 28th, um, we have our webinar on natural history study results and gait study plans. So if you haven't registered for that, please do and join us. All right. Thank you, guys. Have a good day. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.